Welcome to my channel. This video is the third and final part of my three-part critique for Netflix's Japanese television series, My Husband Won't Fit. There are two previous parts that break down every episode, so if you haven't watched those yet, please feel free to do so on my channel and then return to this video. But if you don't mind just watching this portion or you have already watched the last two, then let's dive in. I will organize my thoughts into six sections. First being origin, second, culture, third, what I liked, fourth, what I hated, fifth, final review, and sixth, my version. If you want to listen to certain portions, check out the timestamps in the description below and click on your preferred part. And remember, this video contains major spoilers for the entire series, so please click away if you don't want to be spoiled. Also be warned that this video has mentions of but I have tried my best to describe this in as little detail as possible while still getting my point across. If you enjoyed my critiques and want to see more of them, please like and subscribe to my channel for more videos. This is a growing channel, and with more followers, I'll have a greater chance of building a name on YouTube for all to enjoy. Now then, let's wrap up my thoughts on this interesting show. My Husband Won't Fit stars college sweethearts Kumiko and Kenichi, who encounter an unusual problem in the bedroom. Their efforts to resolve this problem are presented throughout the series and brings up the question of whether this problem is big enough to either tear them apart or make their relationship even stronger. The show was released on Netflix on March 20th, 2019, and it has only one season containing 10 30-minute episodes. The series has received a 6.7 out of 10 rating on IMDb and a 77% rating among Google users. I watched the show back in June 2020 and wanted to weigh on all my thoughts despite discovering it so late. I mean, when you hear about a show centering its drama around people's inability to have sex, you gotta check it out. It just sounds so wacky and hilarious to imagine. But after I finished this series, I found out that before this show was on Netflix, it was a book. And not only was it a book, it was an autobiography. The title of the book is called Oto no Goharanai, which translates to My Husband Doesn't Go In. It was written by an anonymous housewife who goes by the name of Kodama. It's actually really hard to find the exact date of its release since there are so many variations of the story, but it was definitely released sometime after May 2014 when Kodama was selling her book under a different name at a literary free market before releasing the real version shortly afterwards. It became a bestseller in Japan, but the title of the book did raise a lot of eyebrows. According to SoraNews24.com, Kodama states that she knew the title would be risque, but chose to be explicit by adding in the title to not sugarcoat the major issue within the story. When the book was released, there were a lot of men calling bookstores to persuade clerks to say the title for their enjoyment. It was happening so often that a rule was made. If someone were to repeatedly call a store to ask for the name of this book, they would be inhibiting the store's ability to function normally, and the caller could face up to three years in prison or a 500,000 yen fine. The autobiography starts off with Kodama moving into an apartment for college and meeting her future husband. They attempt to make love only for it to fail, but she marries him regardless in the hopes that things will improve. But to her dismay, it doesn't, and she further describes the challenges she faces because of this. I have no clue of what happens in the book after that point, so I will refrain from taking the show's interpretation of Kodama's story at face value. While the beginning sounds accurate to the show's depiction, that may just be the only thing based on a true story. Many things are considered to be based on a true story, but only because pieces of the actual story are included in what would usually be entirely fictional. I mean, I would surely hope that this show is in a mirror of the author's life, because if so, I have some concerns. It's important to note that this drama was a book adaptation because now we can understand as an audience that the struggle Kumi and Ken go through isn't just some unbelievable fiction, but it can happen in real life. 
I'm curious if Kodama ever fixed her problem with her husband, or did it go exactly like it did in the show? You can't trust these based on true story plots because they can easily exaggerate events. So, if someone knows what happens in the book, please leave a comment down below. I would be very interested. I am a born and raised American woman, and as such, my reaction to this series may vary greatly from the average Japanese viewer. So, I think it is my responsibility to quickly research Japanese culture so we can have a better understanding of the characters' behavior throughout the show. A big reason why this book grew to be so popular is due to its explicit title. I can imagine it would be a big hit in the United States as well, but Japan is a great place to debut such a book, considering the fact that sex is not exactly expressed with candor. In fact, Japan has been ridiculed in memes for this subject alone, being referred to as sexless Japan, because being intimate is becoming less and less prevalent in Japanese people's lives. According to japantimes.co.jp, a survey done in 2015 reveals that Japanese people aged 18 to 34 showed that about 42% of men and 44.2% of women admitted that they were virgins. TheGuardian.com states that many sexually uninterested males are typically labeled in three ways. Soshoku danshi, otaku, and hikikomori. They are portrayed as loners raised in the afterglow of Japan's post-war boom, redeemable only through acts of chivalry, a stereotype spawned by the 2005 domestic hit movie, Train Man. The University of Tokyo's latest study of Japan's virginity crisis focuses on financial, regional, and generational data, meaning that the majority of sexless men are either jobless or work part-time and live in smaller cities or suburban areas. Money and mobility matter to women, and these men cannot provide that. At this point, lots of men and women reaching their 30s aren't even considering having a relationship at all. This proves to be detrimental to the future of Japan, as there are less birth rates every year, and people are in fear that if this keeps up, there will be no Japanese legacy to carry onward. It doesn't help that PDA, or public displays of affection, are looked down upon in Japan. While it is becoming more normalized in their society, it is still not all that common to see Japanese couples showing their love for each other in public, since this is considered to be a private act that can disturb other people, particularly the elderly. Even saying I love you can be too much, or giving a kiss can be viewed as foreplay, so the most you may spot is a couple holding hands and leaving all of their affection for the bedroom. A woman by the name of Peggy documents the potential cultural clash one may have when dating a Japanese citizen, based on her own experiences with her husband, who was raised in Tokyo. In an article posted on Guidable.co in 2018, Peggy states, quote, For many cultures, open displays of affection are considered standard daily practices. However, if you are dating a Japanese person, you will need to understand the difference between public and private, as well as Location, location, location. Public affection is a common concern among internationals dating Japanese individuals. They don't understand how Japanese can be so affectionate in private and indifferent when with others, which can lead to misunderstandings, arguments, or even the end of a relationship. Despite being the least sexually active country, sex is not viewed as taboo in Japan. According to a 2011 article from Bedsider.org, you may not express affection, and there may not be people wanting sex, but it is completely normal to do things such as read sexual material in public or attending love hotels, even regardless of your marital status. There's no shame when it comes to having sex before marriage, but even so, the rate at which Japanese people are having it is extremely low compared to other countries. My opinion is that they may be more comfortable with hearing about sex rather than going through the efforts of building a strong relationship to maintain a healthy sex life. After all, Japanese culture prides itself on having an individualist mentality rather and than in the past. It was common for people to play matchmaker and help people find their perfect partner through events such as group dating. Nowadays, it's more likely to find people fending for themselves in a dating world. But hey, that's just my opinion as an outsider looking in. 
Gathering all of this information together, it may become clearer to understand why our characters behave the way they do throughout the show. Does that make their actions justified? Well, you can be the judge of that. But for now, let's move on to my opinions. My opinion of the show may have been clear in the last two videos. However, I'd like to specify elements of the show that I liked and disliked. Let's start off on a good note. I enjoyed the major conflict of the story because it gives us exactly what you're expecting when you're going in. It doesn't beat around the bush about what the problem is. You know exactly what is going on with this couple less than 30 minutes into the first episode. So you will not be duped into something you didn't plan to see. The topic is fascinating and it's the hook that keeps you invested in the story. And if you knew beforehand that this was based on a true story, that could be an even greater incentive to keep watching. The length of the show is also a positive because it knows exactly how long a story like this should take. This is a story of how miscommunication can go off the rails and create a problem into something way bigger than it needs to be. I'm glad that it got to the point, showed the character flaws that led to the consequences they faced, and wrapped up the story before it got even more crazy. There's only so much time you can dedicate to a story about two people not being honest with one another before the audience gets annoyed. But trust me, that doesn't mean it didn't annoy me. I'm just glad the show didn't overstay its welcome. The soundtrack is also well-crafted. It is best described as lost and a tad bit goofy. Like it knows its conflict looks hilarious on the outside, but it's a dire situation for our main characters. They try to play it off like it's no big deal, but over time, the soundtrack gets more erratic and desperate, holding a mask up to pretend everything is all happy when really you're falling apart because you know the love of your life is going to leave you if you have no solution on how you're going to be able to fit. That's the best way I can describe it. The music brings a lighthearted aura to scenes that would otherwise be boring to watch, which is a good thing. But other times, the timing of the music was misplaced in scenes where the moment should have been taken a little more seriously. This doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, it's very uncomfortable to sit through. Despite this, I don't see an issue with the music choice at all. I believe it was well done for the tone they were going for in the show. It's nothing you would frantically search for on YouTube to listen to again, but for the most part, it did its job. The last thing I enjoyed is, believe it or not, the actors. Actors and characters are two totally different things. The actor is the person who is performing the story. They are playing the character which is a completely different entity to the actor. It is common for folks to combine the actor and the character together and attack actors because they believe their personality is akin to the character they played. With that being said, the characters may have not been my favorite, but the actors did a decent job. Just based on body language, verbal patterns, and expressions, I knew what kind of people the characters were thanks to the acting. Natsumi Ishibashi, who plays Kumiko, does an excellent job of behaving meek and shy throughout the entire show. You want to feel sorry for her. You really do. And that is because Ishibashi gives off an energy that you want to sympathize with. I have no clue how this actress is in real life, but if she's the opposite of Kumi, then she does a fantastic job of going outside of her comfort zone. Aoi Nakamura, who plays Kenichi, is also a good actor. Although, I'm still uncertain about how the writers wanted Ken to be portrayed. By the end of the show, I didn't like him at all. And if that's what they were going for, then Nakamura helped with solidifying that. But if we're meant to view Ken as a loving husband with some character flaws that can be redeemed, then I would argue that this wasn't presented well. Whether you love or hate Kumi, Ishibashi's acting can fit into either category. You can see her as a loving wife who is strong enough to forgive herself and her husband and move forward, or a beaten down wife who is only settling for what she knows because she's scared to be independent. Either way, it works. But if you view Ken as an upstanding husband who changed his cheating ways to be with his wife, that's a little wobbly since what he says about sex questions his ability to stay monogamous. If you see Ken as a scumbag who is also settling for what he knows because he's taken advantage of Kumi's dependency, then why present the ending in such a happy light? Like, this is okay. 
I don't know if I'm making sense, but regardless, I can tell that both of them really tried their best to portray these characters properly, and that's a positive. The same can be said for side characters like Kumi's mom and Miyuki. Even the most punchable of faces have amazing actors because they motivate you to brew with that hatred. If they weren't good, then I wouldn't feel anything. So kudos to them. Since we just got off the topic of actors, let's slide right into the characters because I did not like them one bit. Again, the fact that I'm able to hate them this much is a testament to how well done the acting was, but that doesn't hold me back from explaining what I did not like about these characters. A majority of the time, I got the sense that the way I was feeling about them was the wrong choice. I'm supposed to like these characters, and even when I don't, have some sympathy for them, when in actuality, that was just way too difficult. I've taken their culture into account and so forth, and even with all that information, it hasn't changed my mind about how I feel. I'll describe four major characters that I had the most issues with. Kumi's online friend. I forgot this man's name and don't care to remember. All you have to know is that he was the first person Kumi slept with outside of her marriage. He was her online friend on a chat website that turned out to be a dating website, to Kumi's surprise. And upon meeting the man in person, he attacks Kumi and leaves her distraught and on the path of her downward spiral to sleeping with random men. He is an absolute creep, through and through, with nothing redeemable about him. But the show portrays this man in a much nicer light than he should be. In my first video, I go into detail about his scene with Kumi and the tactics that were used to make his attack less harrowing than it was, which makes Kumi's trauma come off as more comical and downright insulting. Also, the scene where he reunited with Kumi at her school also makes Kumi come out to be the bad person while his hands are wiped clean of any culpability he caused to make her situation happen. It's best to assume that this man just went on with his life after the events of the show, which is terrifying. Remember, he had a little daughter, or at least someone he called his daughter. I might be reaching. But with how he treated Kumi, I wouldn't be surprised if that little girl wasn't his daughter at all. There are so many possibilities with this character that paint him out to be even more disturbing. Yet he's let off scot-free. Kumi doesn't call him out on what he did, she just accepts it. Whether it's because she was used to that kind of behavior or she didn't feel worthy enough to stand up for herself, this is a terrible thing to portray on television. Oh, so does that mean anything bad should be censored? Anything that results in a bad outcome should just never be addressed? Well, no, that's not my point. Without media that presents the worst of society, we will be sheltering our minds from reality and what tragic events could, and unfortunately, may have very well happened in our world already. We need to address these things to be aware of it and prevent it from happening any further. The show is not wrong for including a character like this, because if this is something that happened to Kodama, then it wouldn't be fair to censor her from opening up about this experience. What bothers me is the fact that the show is making this character out to be a good person, or at the very least not that bad. This is not just your everyday weirdo. He should be in jail, and it irritates me that nothing about the production of the show even implies that this man is not to be liked. If he's never going to be condemned for his actions, the very least that could be done is acknowledge his wrongdoings. And even that wasn't accomplished. Miyuki. Oh boy, I hated this child. <laughs> Great actress, but irritating character. Miyuki was the problem child in Kumi's classroom who eventually drove Kumi to quit her teaching job because of her and her classmates' incessant misdemeanors. I understand that this is a character we shouldn't like, and I'll give the writers some points for this. But after my second viewing, I have an idea of why Miyuki is important to the story. Miyuki is known throughout the school as not only being a problem child, but also having a neglectful mother who stays out late at night with men. It is clear through Miyuki's actions that she is lonely, but her behavior towards Kumi makes it very difficult to feel sorry for her. But in the final episode, Miyuki tells Kumi not to feel sorry about her life. And in that moment, it exemplified everything about who she was as a character. I can conclude from my own observations that Miyuki's purpose in the show was possibly to be a foil for Kumi. 
According to LiteraryDevices.net, a foil is, quote, a character that shows qualities that are in contrast with the qualities of another character. The objective is to highlight the traits of the other character. The term foil, though generally being applied to a contrasting character, may also be used for any comparison that is drawn to portray a difference between two things. This is evident in many forms of media, with some of the most popular foils being George and Lenny from Of Mice and Men, Goku and Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z, or Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy from the Harry Potter series. Have you ever wondered why you tend to attract extroverted people when you are an introvert, or vice versa? That's an example of a foil, two contrasting people coming together to highlight their unique personalities. Kumi and Miyuki are a foil of one another. Both were neglected in their childhood and they sought out attention in different ways. For Kumi, she became introverted and avoided conflict whenever she was faced with problems. She does not confront it unless she is forced to. When she is with Ken, she takes advantage of this relationship by using it as an anchor to keep her life under control. Her knowledge about sex was also very limited, even after she lost her virginity in high school, giving us the idea that she's not too comfortable in embracing her sexuality. Now let's compare this to Miyuki. Although Miyuki is an elementary student, she exudes more dominant energy compared to Kumi. Because of being left alone so much by her mother, on top of whatever trauma she has for not having a father figure, she had to learn to fend for herself and build a tough exterior so nobody else can hurt her. She searches for acceptance with her classmates by being the leader of their debauchery, and she has no problem toying with other people's emotions, as we have witnessed with her encounters with Kumi. When Kumi gets close to discovering her troubled home life, that's when Miyuki begins to act up, which could be a defense mechanism so Kumi hates her so much that she wouldn't want to check on her again. We can assume that she is aware of the complexities of dating and sleeping around based on how nonchalant she is in episode 6 about the strange man in her home. She took the role of being the mom in her home and the only outlet to really being a kid is at school. And those who feel her wrath will find it hard to see that this is her way of being in control of her world while holding on to her toxic mother. Because even with her neglect, Miyuki does not want to lose what she is accustomed to. And because of this, she forces teachers to hate her, so they do not even care to save her from her own life. You don't have to feel sorry for me. She says this because she's known since the beginning that Kumi has worried for her safety. This is the first time Miyuki openly talks about this, finally being mature enough to have a discussion rather than be on the defensive. By the end, she channeled her energy into club activities and is growing up to be a better human being and potentially Kumi's friend. This is a major turning point for Miyuki, but the problem is it happens too late. It takes a lot of skill to redeem a character in the very last episode, when before that all we witnessed was the heartache they caused to our main character. I have a little more sympathy for Miyuki, only after my second watch. But if I stopped after my first watch, I would have found Miyuki to be totally unnecessary to the plot. Now that i found her purpose, I'm a little softer on this character, but still not by much. Call me unforgiving, but could you watch a kid be rude and chaotic all the time and still like them? That line about her being surprised that Kumi left and her new teacher was super strict still angers me. Like, what did you expect? You certainly didn't show Kumi any love when she was there and now you're complaining about someone needing to discipline you? Give me a break. Kenichi. Ken is an outgoing college student who falls for Kumi almost immediately and becomes a seemingly loving husband until we discover by episode 3 that he is cheating on her with women from a brothel. By the end of the show, he discovers that Kumi is not a virgin and storms out of the house, but not before being outed of his infidelity. At the end, the two reconcile and decide to stay married without having sex or having children. And I'm supposed to root for this guy? That's the vibe I was getting the whole time. Ken was just fallen to temptation and needed the help of his wife to show him the error of his ways. He didn't do anything that bad. He was just a victim to sex and its evil way of capturing people to believe that they are in love. Ken never needed sex at all. 
and it was only thanks to the wickedness of man that he succumbed to it. That is garbage! If you think I'm exaggerating, watch the show yourself. He talks like this all-knowing being who knows he's wrong, but is too weak to fight against it. Similar to how predators react when people find out about their crimes. Well, they should have, have left me on. Anyone would have done it with what they were wearing. He basically says this after he sleeps with a brothel girl in episode 7. He states that allegedly, she came on to him and slept with him because she loved him so much. Well, if you didn't want it to happen, Ken, then that's assault and you need to report it. If not, which it clearly wasn't, Ken is blaming the girl for having sex and not himself a married man. I feel like the writers were trying to mirror Ken's first time sleeping outside the marriage versus Kumi's, and if you put the two side by side, they are clearly different. Even though Kumi didn't stop seeing her attacker, it's obvious that she was traumatized by what happened, whereas Ken is calmly explaining what happened to his supposed attacker. No shame, nor fear, and continues to return to the place where he was assaulted, purposely leaving out clues to his infidelity back at home. It's like, help me, Kumi. If you don't confront me about what I'm doing, then I have no choice but to continue. Ken can still stay with Kumi, and they can still choose not to have sex, but I'm not convinced that he's going to stay devoted to Kumi like the show makes it out to be. In the back of his mind, he's just waiting for another excuse to return to the brothel and make himself out to be the victim. Kumi. I was pretty hard on Kumi during my episode breakdown, and sorry to say, it's not going to get any better. Since she's the main character, we see her with the most character development, or lack thereof, which is why I gave her a three strike rule in my previous videos. Three strikes, you're out. The three strikes representing the point where my hatred for Kumi grew. The first being when she lied about being a virgin. The second when she doesn't confront Ken about his cheating. And the third was hard to pinpoint, so I just said the entirety of episodes 6 to 10. Japanese women are known to be more demure and non-direct when faced with conflict, but this just takes it to a whole new level. A positive thing that I can say is that I understand where all of this is coming from. Her childhood was toxic. It made her feel unloved by her mother, and her father was an alcoholic cheater. So that's the only male role model she had for a long time. For daughters, it's easy to fall in love with someone who is similar to your father. And with Kumi being so sheltered all of her life, she easily falls for the first man she sees when she is on her own that turns out to be just as bad as the father. I still don't get out of why out of the three daughters, Kumi was the black sheep. And I would have been excited to dive deeper into that story, but I have theories. Since Kumi is the eldest child, her mother probably associates her with being forced to stay with her father. Otherwise, I have no clue why the mom hates her or left her behind when she moved away. I don't see Kumi as a good character because she doesn't change. She adapts. When she finds out her husband is cheating, she never confronts him about it until he gets mad at her for not being a virgin. And even then, there is nothing to support that she is even a little angry with him for what he did. She's depressed when he leaves and quickly falls back into his arms to make a fresh start. Nothing about her shows that she builds self-esteem, which can be an incredible character arc for her. Think about it. She was raised to believe that she was unworthy of love, has a husband who cheats on her. She cheats as well, and when confronted with it, she learned to forgive herself by giving her body to men to hide her pain. And she leaves her husband because she knows she can do better. But here we're told that, yeah, your husband can cheat on you and blame you for what happened and you can still work it out and be a happy couple without ever resolving the problem that got you in trouble in the first place. This is Kumi trying to ignore the issues and hope for a better future without putting in the effort. Her final scene with Miyuki annoyed me as well. The power dynamic between the two was the same as it was in the beginning. And this was proven by Kumi's line, where she talks about how she never felt loved by her mother. Maybe she was attempting to connect with Miyuki about their toxic parents, but Miyuki laughs it off and says that she should be pitied, illustrating how that attempt clearly didn't work. 
Kumi comes off desperate trying to bond with a child who never gave her any respect. Yeah, but didn't you say that Miyuki was being disrespectful because she was scared of letting people in? So wouldn't Kumi bonding with Miyuki be a sign of growth for her? If your partner constantly berated you, telling you you're good for nothing and never listened to what you had to say, would you congratulate yourself for trying to stay in touch with them? Yes, Miyuki's character is complex and can be well liked in its execution, but from Kumi's position, wanting to be Miyuki's friend without any sort of apology or act of kindness makes Kumi out to be worse than before. She tried her hardest to discipline Miyuki and the other kids to no avail, and at the end, after she quit her job because of this girl, she purposely returns to her apartment to give her cake and be her friend? Uh, yeah, no. What could have worked is Kumi running into Miyuki a year or two later while running errands, and Miyuki expressing how she's been since she left. Then, when Kumi attempts to go on about her day, Miyuki stops her and says that she was surprised that she left the school, to which Kumi would laugh about, making Miyuki nod in agreement that, yeah, it's obvious why she left. And Miyuki would either apologize for her mistakes, which would make sense in a country that prides itself on apologizing, or just tell Kumi that she wishes the best in her life while showing deep regret for her behavior. This would make Miyuki more likable and willing to take accountability on her own, and Kumi knowing her worth and not caring about what happens to Miyuki onwards. Yeah, she's a kid, and of course Kumi would care, but not enough to stay in her life. Sometimes with toxic people, you need to love them from afar. Kumi's descent into depravity is also ridiculous. I know when it started with that disturbing attack scene, but it really made me uncomfortable. Not only uncomfortable, but ill. I hated those scenes, and it didn't help me like Kumi either. The montage of her sleeping with random men is supposed to be at a point where you pity her, but I hated her. Similar to Ken, the show makes her out to be a victim of circumstances, and she is powerless to stop herself. In every scene, she has this blank stare on her face. A literal blank slate, like she's out of it and devoid of any emotion. Until that one crying scene. Something about how she looks while this is happening made me even more enraged. More than I'd like to admit. It was why I was skeptical of making a review in the first place because I didn't want to watch those scenes again. But I felt like I had to, just in case someone out there relates to how I felt. It's not just her cheating on her husband, but who she's doing it with. Hate on Ken all you want, but he at least knows the girls he sleeps with are clean and located in one place. Kumi, on the other hand, meets her men on the internet, doesn't ask any questions about whether they're clean or not, nor any pictures. It's as simple as, oh, you're a man. Want to meet up? This is super dangerous, especially for a woman who can get pregnant from one of these encounters. Kumi does not get a damn about her health, and it is at a point where she could be killed at one of these meetings and wouldn't care because her self-esteem is that low. If she had just spoken to her husband about the infidelity or confessed that she was assaulted, this could have been avoided. But this makes her out to be so irresponsible and even dumb. She didn't even realize the chat site she was on was a dating site until someone told her. How do you mess that up? If all of this really happened, then I am so sorry for Kodama. I would hope that nobody felt as bad about themselves to willingly go to dangerous places, but it's so hard to root for Kumi too when she is making obviously poor life choices. Maybe it would have helped if her character was developed to be a more confident before episode 5. Like when she marries Ken, she actively tries to find a solution to their problems and explores her sexuality more other than just trying baby oil that one time. Which as a result, gives her confidence that she could solve this issue without any involvement from doctors. However, when she is attacked in episode 5, her hopes are crushed and she falls into despair. When you have hope, your disappointment is worse than if you didn't have any hope at all. So it would have been more tragic if we take out Ken's cheating and Miyuki's torment and have Ken and Kumi try to work things out before Kumi's attack. Once that happens, Kumi emotionally detaches herself from Ken, which makes Ken feel unloved and go outside marriage. Kumi learns about his cheating, 
and convinces herself that it's her fault and she is only worth being a toy for men to abuse. This could have been a lot more heartbreaking because as the audience, we too feel the rise and fall of their relationship due to this dramatic event, and it would be more understandable for Kumi to not address that to her husband out of fear compared to her hiding about having sex that one time. I literally threw that idea in the air, but I'd like to think it would be better displayed than what we actually got. My overall impression of this show, with the inclusion of my second watch and cultural knowledge, is that it has a clear message about the negative effects of miscommunication, but the execution of this message gives off a bad aftertaste. Characters lie about things that they don't need to lie about, act passive-aggressively to put blame on their partner so they don't come off as the bad guy, barely grow as a character, if at all, and are purely dependent on one another because they are afraid of being alone. This is something that a lot of couples can go through, but it's hard to make them likable if all you witness are those moments. Kumi and Ken as a couple feels rushed and forced. Like I mentioned in my first video, the opposites attract trope can work here, but there needs to be enough attraction to make it make sense. Ken probably liked Kumi for her innocence and naivete to things, which in hindsight could have encouraged him to cheat even more, since he sensed that she wouldn't stand up for herself. But Kumi did not seem to like Ken romantically. She looked more afraid of being around Ken until right before he asked to date her. If we had more scenes of them being a couple, instead of Ken showing her around the neighborhood, then this relationship could have been more believable. Episode 9 helps me with this theory because there's a scene where Kumi reminisces on a date the two of them went on where they bought ice cream. Such a normal date brought up more likability between the two, and the scrapbook Kumi had as well. In her scrapbook, she had photos of their wedding and outings they had when they looked really happy, and not stress like they are in 90% of this series. Why not dedicate an episode to that? Their problem never gets resolved, and neither of them go into depth about what drove them to cheating on each other. There isn't even a brief scene of them going to a therapist or having a calmer talk about this. So as a viewer, you're wondering if either of them know the whole truth. Does Ken ever find out that Kumi was assaulted? Or that she cheated on him too? What we see on screen is that all Ken learns is that Kumi is not a virgin. I don't know if he's ever told of everything else, because if he was, I don't think they would have made up so quickly. Ken was outraged just from learning Kumi lied about her past, so to learn then that she was giving up her body to strangers is a big reason to fly off the handle. As Kumi's partner, do you know how disgusting that is? You're exposing yourself and your husband to potential diseases or unwanted pregnancy. It doesn't matter that he can't fit. That's still extremely wrong. Once they make up, the tone of the show shifts into whether or not they should have kids. And why? They never brought up wanting kids in the beginning. All they were concerned about was having sex. This isn't even implied before episode 7. And this fear begins after Ken has a talk with his parents. So it comes off like they're worried about parenthood because they're being pressured to worry about it. If the topic of having kids was brought up as early as, say, episode 2, when they were asking permission to be married, that could raise the stakes for them having to physically be compatible, because they're not just missing out on the pleasures of making love, but also having a biological child. But never did I fathom Kumi or Ken pondering about being parents until at the very end, so it comes off super rushed, and as an added reason to come off as righteous compared to other couples, for denying themselves the chances of being parents. That's what I think it is. Kumi and Ken being like, we're not like other couples. We don't need sex or kids to stay in a happy marriage. Everyone else relies on those things to be happy, but not us. We're totally at peace without them. When that is clearly not the case, given everything we've witnessed up to this point. Part of me thinks the writers do know that Kumi and Ken are lying to themselves about being happy without these things, but there isn't enough evidence to be sure of that. When Kumi asks Ken if they're just lying to themselves, and he responds, what if we are? That's the only indicator where I feel like the writers want us to know, hey, we know they're terrible people, but are too scared to lose one another. 
this is a sad ending after all. Even so, that's just what part of me is saying. If I can't be confident in my own opinion, then it's more likely that this wasn't the writer's intention. My Husband Won't Fit is a show about a couple's physical incompatibility and how far they will go to work things out in spite of this issue. What appears to be a thoughtful story about the power of love looks to me more like a story of emotionally dependent people who pretend to love each other but really are just too afraid to move on because they're the only ones who will put up with each other's nonsense. I was left feeling annoyed, disturbed, and rolling my eyes at this couple who is so brave to live on without the burden of sex. Keep thinking you're so special. Now that I finally got all of my thoughts out the way, here are two alternate storylines I created that are arguably better at presenting the show's message. The first one I will title Long Distance Love. The first alternate version is what I believe to be the closest version that we have to the original. Kumi and Ken meet in college and they fall in love. Kumi learns to open up to Ken and Ken learns to communicate better with Kumi. They both wait until they are married before trying to make love. This choice is made because of their damaged backgrounds. Kumi had a bad experience with someone who took her virginity and shunned her afterwards, making her the talk of her school. Kumi always prided herself on being a good, innocent girl, but when people discover she slept with a random boy, they mock her about it. Because of this trauma, Kumi prefers to wait until marriage to make love again, so that she is confident that this relationship will last. As for Ken, he was a player in high school and slept around as much as he could just to say that he did it. But when he met Kumi, he realized she was different and wanted to change his ways for her. So, despite not being the biggest fan of the idea, Ken agrees to wait until marriage. They don't have to wait long though, because when Ken takes a new job in the city, Kumi is distraught, and as a way to feel closer together, Ken proposes to Kumi, and they get married. The night before Ken has to move, they try to make love, which is when they discover that they are not physically compatible. Waiting until marriage makes this issue far more challenging, because marriage is a long process, and divorces also. Wanting to break up because of this mishap would make Kumi and Ken feel selfish. They don't have time to fix this situation right away because Ken moves to the city the following day. Ken promises to Kumi that he will earn enough money to get a place of their own, but for now, they must communicate long distance. This is where the story can go down two roads, light or dark. The light path will make things a lot more lighthearted, comical, and easy to stomach. But the dark path will make things harder to watch and more complex with an ambiguous ending. I'll start with the dark path to keep major plot points the same from the source material. Kumi and Ken attempt to handle the relationship long distance, but find it very difficult to do so. Ken is stressed out, and Kumi is ashamed that despite being an introvert, she longs to be in the company of others. Not having Ken around is becoming a burden to her spirit, and there's not much she can do to help that. Her parents are nearby, but estranged, and her sisters are both pregnant, so she doesn't want to be reminded of how she can't even do anything in the bedroom. There may be a montage of her attempting to do things by herself, and it working smoothly, which leaves her incredibly confused since it doesn't work with Ken. This is where she goes on an online chat website to get advice from other women about tips in the bedroom. One woman catches Kumi's eye, and the two strike up a friendship. Kumi speaks to this woman for several weeks before inviting her to her apartment. However, upon meeting this person, Kumi is shocked to find out that her friend was actually a man the whole time. Kumi berates the man for lying on the site and politely asks him to leave, but he doesn't take no for an answer. He follows her to her apartment door, insisting that they should talk, but she still says no. Upon opening her door, the man pushes her inside the home and closes the door behind him before taking Kumi by force. When the man leaves, he teases Kumi about how things worked for him more than it did for her husband, and Kumi simply lies on the floor, expressionless. She keeps her blank facade until the man finally leaves. Then she allows herself to break down and cry over her attack. Her loneliness got the better of her, she thinks, and now she is left feeling ashamed. 
Ken and Kumi call one another a few times a week, but Ken notices that Kumi is starting to be extremely quiet lately and feels offended by this. Every time he tries to reach out is met with silence or short messages like, I'm busy or okay. Ken feels shafted by Kumi and so unloved that he acts on his impulse to sleep with another woman. This woman could be a co-worker or a friend. And this is the seed that sends Ken spiraling back into his old habits of sleeping around with people to fill a void in his own heart. And much to Kumi's dismay, her mother takes the opportunity to call and confess that she saw Ken with another woman when she went into the city. Kumi, in her lowest of lows, easily believes the mother because she feels so worthless that it's easy to assume Ken no longer wants her. So, to vent out her frustrations, she quits her online chat forum with the women and creates an account on a hookup app to meet strangers. Cut to a montage of Kumi and Ken cheating on one another until Ken chooses to surprise Kumi at the apartment. An argument ensues where they reveal their infidelity. And in order to not just end the show abruptly, something would happen where they both just start breaking down crying, showing that there is still a long way to go before they are healed from what they have done to one another. They go to therapy where Kumi admits her infidelity began when she was attacked, which makes Ken feel even more terrible because he didn't bother to look for the root of the problem. He just made assumptions and went back on his old ways because it was easier for him to do that than to try and understand what was going on. The end of the show leaves Kumi with a big decision. Stay together and work things out or break up. Ken at this point has earned enough money saved to get a home for both of them in the city and Kumi must choose to stay where she is to make a life for herself or go with Ken to make a fresh start. There is a cliffhanger, leaving the audience guessing what choice she made. The ending would leave people enraged and talking for weeks, but it leaves the audience to interpret the ending and decide for themselves. If they were in this relationship, would they have the heart to forgive and move on? Let's lighten things up a bit and return to the beginning, where Ken leaves for the city. A lighter version of this story can have Ken and Kumi immediately practicing on themselves in their own time to see if they are the ones causing the problems in the bedroom. We can get some funny imagery of Kumi looking at phallic objects on the love shop to try out, or Ken doing research on how big is too big at work. They don't discuss this exploration together out of embarrassment, but they do talk intimately often to keep the spark alive. Whenever Ken travels down to visit Kumi, they awkwardly try not to make things about sex, even though both are clearly repressed. Ken wants to respect Kumi's boundaries, and Kumi wants to hide away the object she bought to not look perverted. They're not being honest with each other, which leads to them feeling more isolated. They blame themselves for their issues and start to feel bad that the other married them in the first place. Ken goes even further with his perversion by discovering that there is a nearby brothel that could satisfy his every need. Meanwhile, Kumi befriends a man in the neighborhood who appears to be a nice guy, but one day when they're hanging out, he discovers the things she bought to try on herself. He teases her, saying things like, I didn't know you were this dirty. She begs him to forget what he ever saw, and that she wants no one to know she has them. But this guy goes, not even your husband, but you invited me to your place where I could have seen them. So you are actually okay with me knowing about this. The man suggests that they make love so she can learn how it is to have sex, assuming that she's a virgin. But Kumi throws him out. Kumi can't stand to imagine that this creepy man is the only one that knows her secret and not her husband. So she encourages Ken to come over to the apartment a little earlier than expected for a surprise. Ken arrives, with the audience unaware of whether or not he went to the brothel, and Kumi shows off her things, and with a little encouragement from Ken, she performs for him with the objects. Eventually, Ken involves himself as well. He helps her with the objects, and it turns out to be a very intimate bonding moment. They're relieved to know that both of them have been trying to experiment to be better lovers, and Ken admits that he was grateful that he didn't go to the brothel, because all he needs is right in front of him. Kumi is a little bit hurt at first by him even thinking of going, but she knows that she's hidden stuff from him too, and as long as he didn't do anything, then all is well. 
Ken also admits that in a couple weeks, he'll finally be able to get a home for the two of them in the city. And then we'll get a shot of them, maybe a few months later, situated in a home getting professional help for their problem in the bedroom. But no matter how long it takes, it'll be okay. Because they know other ways to satisfy one another. The second story is more focused on Miyuki. The beginning is essentially the same though. Kumi and Ken fall in love, try to have sex but fail, get married, and have teaching jobs. Kumi is teaching young children and decides that one day she hopes to start a family with Ken. She wasn't sure at first because she wasn't confident in the idea of being a mother because of her own ch toxic childhood. But after teaching those little kids, she has more faith that she'll be able to handle anything. That is, until Miyuki shows up. Like in the show, Kumi is transferred to another classroom teaching 6th graders, and Miyuki is their leader, who drove off the first teacher. More commonality ensues from the show, with Miyuki and the kids being nice at first, then after trying to meet with Miyuki's mom, everyone acts up and Kumi is unable to control the class. Kumi vents to Ken about these issues and says out of anger that for the first time she's happy to not be able to have sex with her husband because then she wouldn't be able to have kids. Ken is upset about this because he expressed his desire for kids too and was making an effort to try and fit inside Kumi. He knows this is out of frustration so he lets Kumi get away with it for now. But one thing he does mention is that Kumi should try to talk to the mother again about Miyuki's behavior. Kumi is fearful, but does so anyways. Another night, Kumi meets the mother and the whole conversation in the show happens here, including Miyuki talking about the man being at the apartment. But now, after that comment, we get a shot of said man within the apartment. He looks disheveled and dangerous to be around. He takes a swig of alcohol and watches TV. Kumi can't help but whisper to Miyuki if everything is okay. Miyuki responds stoically with her woman comment. You're a woman, so you must understand. Which makes Kumi even more confused. She begs Miyuki to open up, even if it's not in that moment. At school, somewhere, because it's okay to be open to people. Miyuki ignores this and slams the door in her face. Another day at school with the same chaos is reaching a boiling point for Kumi. And Miyuki knows that. So just like in the show, she pretends she's bored of playing and says, let's play a different game. Kumi doesn't get her at all. And with what she just did, Kumi is sure that Miyuki is just playing mind games. So Kumi snaps and tells everyone to not play anymore and sit down and do their work. It's the first time Kumi has been so stern, which scares everyone. A meeting is held with Kumi, some other teachers, and parents. And like the show, they discuss the kids' behavior. Everyone agrees that they are driving the school mad and Kumi is near a breakdown. All because of Miyuki. But Kumi disagrees. She says it's not just Miyuki's fault. In fact, Miyuki's behavior shows that she's in great distress and is just crying out for attention. The parents refuse to believe something like that. But after the meeting, Kumi encourages the other teachers to have an investigation on Miyuki's home life. Now, at this point, my thoughts got a little muddled on how the following events would occur, but this is just an idea, so don't take it too seriously. Authorities discover Miyuki's terrible living situation and remove her from the home and into child services. Kumi finds out about this in class, where the rest of the kids are behaving again without Miyuki's presence. Kumi begs to find out where Miyuki is, but the teachers frankly don't care. You said to check on her, and we did. Now she's in a better place and she's out of our hands. The other teachers are relieved to no longer deal with this child, but Kumi panics about where she was. Ken is worried that Kumi is too concerned with her student, but Kumi admits that she can't help but feel worried because she feels like it's her responsibility to look after Miyuki. Even after all she did, Kumi was expressing a motherly concern for her. Eventually, Miyuki is found, and out of the kindness of her heart, Kumi decides to adopt her. It doesn't go well by Ken at first, who suspects that this is a ploy to no longer attempt to have kids the natural way. But they have a talk, and Kumi states that they have all the time in the world to keep trying. But the world is telling her to care for Miyuki now. She is the child that they have been waiting for, 
And they shouldn't let something like sex and conceiving naturally hinder a child's safety. Ken is amazed at Kumi's determination to care for Miyuki, even after all she went through. So he makes sure that she is doing this because she wants to, and not just because she feels bad. Kumi reverts back to her childhood where she felt unheard and wanted to live somewhere else, but nobody came to her rescue. She needs me, and we need her, Kumi replies. Miyuki is adopted and is now the daughter of Kumi and Ken. Her little attitude pops up here and there, but you could tell she's grateful for Kumi to take the chance on her, despite all the wrong she's done. And for the rest of their lives, Miyuki will do her best to make up for what she's done to Kumi. And that is it! We are finally done with this critique! I am so happy to have worked this long to share it with you. If you'd like more videos like these, please like and subscribe to my channel right away. Thank you so much for sticking around this long and I hope this gave you a better look into My Husband Won't Fit and encourage you to either not waste your time on a show you would have not enjoyed or check it out anyways to see how crazy it is. I've got to say, despite my negative outlook on it, this show truly is one of a kind and will remain in my memories for a very long time. Thank you once again and take care.